have been uh, studying the book of Joel in the overall theme of restoration science and uh, through the last two chapters we have seen how God takes us through the process of restoration. In the first chapter we looked at uh, the signs of true repentance and in the second chapter we studied about total restoration and uh, the third chapter we will be again uh, studying about uh, further about how God uh, talks about or shows a restoration through the prophet Joel. Uh, just for us to understand once again or remind ourselves about the context of uh, the book of Joel, the prophecies come uh, through the prophet Joel during a time of a great plague where the swarm of locusts had eaten away almost everything uh, that the people of God uh, they had had and right after the plague is what uh, the Joel the prophetess comes to the people and warning them that a greater uh, incident a greater uh, 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 attack would come on God's people if they do not return back to God and with that warning he also gives them a good news of restoration which we uh, studied in the second chapter let me remind you of the chapter 2 and verse 25 where God says I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten the hopper the destroyer and the cutter my great army which I sent against you though in the first chapter we saw that how uh, because of their sins they, the, lo the swarming locusts had destroyed everything in the second chapter we saw what God's restoration does that it restores people not only you know back to the old position but God restores everything there's only which God can do so the book of joy is a great encouragement of not only for us to return back to God with a sincere heart it is also a great encouragement to uh, learn what God's restoration can do in our lives and today we will be studying the third chapter and I would uh, take this meditation on the title triumphal restitution uh, yeah, let me read the uh, first two verses to begin with chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2 for then in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people and my heritage Israel because they have scattered them among the nations they have divided my land. So before I get into this uh, the whole chapter the meditation there are few things that I would like to share here. One is God's restoration is not only you know, restoring us back to you know, the old place. That is why you know, for the third chapter I have used this term called restitution. Restitution is more than restoration. What is restitution? Where God not only restores, He also adds things over that. That is what you know, restoration does. Uh, that is what God's restoration does. No, no man can actually can do that. Now, that is what we are going to even look at in this chapter. Another thing that we see in this third chapter is, it talks about not only the restoration of the present state, it also talks about the final restoration also. That is why you know the third chapter is, is quite complex. When you read those verses, you know, kind of uh, it might look, uh, look difficult to actually interpret. Because it is uh, through the prophet Joel was talking about a present incident and then he is also uh, was prophesying about and another, uh, another event that was to take place in some years time and he was also in the prophecy, he was also talking about what would happen in the last days. And when I say last days, the third chapter, the prophecy is also about the first coming of Jesus and also about the second coming of Jesus. So all these events, almost four you know, events, chronological events are packed into this chapter. So that is how uh, you know, the, the complexity of the third chapter is. But, in, through, but within this, you know, we can understand how God's restoration 
it looks like in our life you know when as i said when god restores it just not only restores us back to the place where we were earlier but to a better place that's what god uh, does and here today in this chapter you know in fact i divide this whole chapter into six uh, categories so we will look at one is through this restitution uh, what did god do or what will god do to the enemies of god's people that we will look at in the first section and the next five sections we will look at uh, uh, what does this restitution does to god's people we're going to look at both so the very first thing that uh, god says that what i will do when i restore my people because the third chapter begins with that in those days and at that time when i restore what will i do the very first thing god says is that he will uh, he will punish or he will judge the nations that were against god's people that is how you know he begins in fact the very the first the 15 verse almost you know more than half of this chapter god talks about those judgment and god talks about the punishment that comes upon the people let me read the fourth verse here third chapter and fourth verse what are you to me o tyre and sidon and all the regions of philistia are you paying me back for something if you are paying me back i will turn your deeds back upon your own heads swift and speedily what is actually god saying here now sometimes we might wonder how will god judge you know how does god's judgment will look like you know there are two ways in in which actually you know we need to understand god's judgment because the third chapter joel the prophet joel is talking about judgment one is god will judge his people that's why the first two chapters he talk he says to people he wants people that if you don't return back to god and if you don't uh, accept the restoration of god oh, a judgment is coming upon you oh, that is a judgment on god's people so how does god judge the world one of the major or the most important areas where how god will judge the world is how the world deals or treats god's people you know the whole bible is actually filled with that not only in the old testament even in the in also the new testament in the gospels jesus has spoken about it in the epistles the apostles have spoken about it let us how the world deals with the church there are actually two areas we need to understand uh, through the prophet joel actually god is talking about two things about the judgment on god on the nations in regards to their dealing with god's people one how they deal with israel and also how they deal with the church so there are two things that are involved here how does the world deal with the the jewish people israel and also how does the world deals with the church so based on this god's judgment will be on Uh, the people of the world that is one aspect of this judgment that is the other aspect of judgment of where whether the people have committed the life accepted the good news or not that's another aspect but in in regards to the world's dealing with the people of god is is very important Now that's why in fact the whole the 15 till 15 verse god is saying that how did you deal with my people in the same way i'm going to deal with you i'm going to judge you i'm going to punish you now that is why zechariah says the prophet zechariah says in zechariah chapter 2 verse 8 for thus said the lord of hosts after his glory sent me regarding the nations that plundered you truly one who touches you touches the apple of my eye you know that's why the prophet zechariah saying that god says to those nations who plundered the people of god that the one the one who touches you touches the apple of my of, uh, of my eye that is when you and i go through you know persecution when you and i go through uh the troubles from the world god looks at as if as though he is being touched as though he is being troubled you know that is why when uh, saul of tarsus when he meets with christ what does uh, christ uh, jesus say to him 
the the encounter the very first encounter when he has on the road to damascus that saul saul why are you persecuting me no so saul was persecuting the christians and this is how god looks at god says saul why are you persecuting me that is touching god's children is touching god himself you know what a great encouragement this is you know uh, and persecuting god's people is persecuting god himself that's what god is saying to 15 the all of all of the 15 chapters in the times that we are living in god's people are persecuted globally everywhere in some form or the other in some places you know the persecution is severe but in some places the persecution persecution might look mild and moderate but still it is there you know if you undergo you know injustice because you are a christian at your workplace you know be encouraged you know because god is saying the one who touches you it touches the apple of my eye you know the same god is what whom we worship that's why this uh, the third chapter is a great encouragement that when we go through injustice you know, because we are god's children we need not worry we need not be uh, you know uh, depressed discouraged because god is for us god is fighting for us you know the entire of the 15th verse is look at the you know the uh, look at the uh, 7th verse he says but now i will rouse them to leave the places to which you have sold them and then you know look at the 9th verse proclaim this among the nations prepare war stir up the warriors and all soldiers draw near the god is saying 11th verse come quickly all you nations all around gather yourselves there bring down your warriors Uh, oh lord what god is saying calling the nations to war that is it also talks about the final war as i said you know this chapter involves you know uh, different chronological events put together but right? this so the chapter also talks about the final war now look at the 12th verse let the nations rouse themselves and come up to the valley of jehoshaphat actually there is no valley by name valley of jehoshaphat in israel but we understand that jehoshaphat is means Jehovah judges God judges so it means a value of judgment so it talks about the day of judgment which is going to come upon the world and look at the 14th verse multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the lord is near in the valley of decision again you know there is this use of the day of the lord which you find in all these three chapters so the day of the lord is coming that is his time is coming and it's a valley it's not only a valley of judgment it's also a valley of decision you know but unfortunately uh, quite often this verse has been misinterpreted as though it means that you know uh, multitudes of people would uh, accept christ you know, people use it in evangelical meetings to say that it's a valley of decision people make a decision for christ actually that doesn't mean that this is actually the decision not uh, for people to make but it's a decision that god makes and it is it is the place of judgment where god decides who will be on who who will enter into his rest and who will not so in this valley of decision the decision does not lie with men but the decision lies with god why the judgment day is not going to be a day you know for people to you know make a reckoning but it's going to be the final payment so the whatever uh whatever repentance people have to make people have to make before that not on that day but what do we see here that it's a great encouragement for us that god you know his he punishes and he stands punishes people who stand against us and he stands for us when we go through persecution or injustice because we are god's people that's a great encouragement and and uh, this uh, chapter begins with this but goes on to talk about you know show five areas of those restoration or restitution on god's people you know in fact i want to focus more on that and i want to you know uh, close with that so the four the five areas of how god restores and adds that that restitution in your life and my life what god does let me uh, let us quickly get into that the first area is the position the new position to which god brings us now look at the uh, the second verse 
And I really love that verse where God says, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jezebel. I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people and my heritage, Israel. Now let me read that in the uh, NLT version, New Living Translation. It says, there I will judge them for harming my people, my special possession, for scattering my people among the nations. Now I want you to look at those uh, words that I have made bold. You know, this is the position that we have in Christ, in God. He says, you are my people. You are my special position. What an amazing position that we have in Christ. This is in a context where God's people are persecuted. But when you and I, you know, are persecuted or when we undergo injustice, you know, many a times, you know, we become discouraged and depressed looking at the circumstance. But what do we need to do is, you know, uh, look at our position in Christ. How does God uh, look at us? Not how does the world look uh, looks at us or not how does the people who oppress or the people who ill treat look at us. You know, it's very easily you know, to look at ourselves in the eyes of uh, our persecutors, oppressors and uh, the people who hate us. You know, it's very easy to actually get into uh, that kind of an uh, you know that kind of a mood and become depressed but be encouraged you know in when we go through such struggles god says you are my people you are my special possession you know what a great encouragement this is that's why you know when uh, paul the apostle was being uh, transferred in the ship when he's going on the ship journey uh, taken uh, by the roman centurion with the you know with the battalion of the soldiers and the, sh the ship is about to wreck you know and this is what he receives a vision of, a, of an angel and this is how he reports it uh, back he's saying in Acts chapter 27 and verse 23 let me read that verse he says for last night there stood by me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship now I want to show two things here one is Paul is a prisoner, but he is a prisoner, is a convict in the eyes of the world. But in God's eyes, he is a one who belongs to God. Amen. See, this is how Paul is looking at that. In fact, you know, the tables turn. The prisoner who was supposed to be at the mercy of you know, the centurion and the captain, now the centurion, the captain, the crew, and the entire ship comes becomes at the mercy of the prisoner Paul. You know how God turns the table. Why? Because you know all those people were a majority. They were armed soldiers, well protected. But Paul the apostle knew that I belong and I worship the living God. That's why he knows boldly could say. The last night that stood by me, an angel of God whom I belong. You know, this belonging, that is what exactly uh, what God says to Prophet Joy to the people. You belong to me. You are my people. You are my special position. What else do we need? You know, when if, we, if we only understand this position in Christ, we will never be you know, afraid of at the face of persecution or when uh, the world you know does injustice to us you know uh, let let us be encouraged you know, like paul because you know the god whom we worship we belong to him and he himself says you are my people you are my possession amen and the second thing that i would like to show here is we are not only positioned in christ we are also protected by god Look at the 16th verse. All the 15 verses, God talks about the punishment that He's going to bring upon the world for their ill dealings with His people. But right when those things happen, you know, when the judgment happens, 16th verse says, in the midst of that, the Lord roars from Zion and utters His voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shake. But the Lord is a refuge. For his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Amen. You know, the world is at turmoil, the world is at confusion, judgment is happening, punishment has just come upon people. 
you know, that is, uh, the, it, it's, it's the roar of, you know, the uh, in Zion of, of God. His voice is uttered because of which the heavens and the earth, everything is in a turmoil, it is shaking. Then because no one can stand God's judgment. But the good news is, we are under the protection of God. You know, when we who commit ourselves you know, to Christ, he says, the Lord is a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. You know, one thing which I have you know, really experienced or learned, even during this uh, time of the plague, you know, this pandemic COVID-19 is, the hope that we have in Christ. And you look at the world, when I talk to people who do not know Christ, non-Christians, I see a lot of fear in them. You know, they are they're fearful of everything. But they don't want to touch uh, anything. You know, they don't want to uh, associate with people. So much of fear is that in, in people. You know, because of this one you know, virus which is invisible. So much of fear. But amidst all of this, you know, chaos and confusion and... Uh, uncertainty and fear God has given his peace in the heart of God's people amen what a great blessing is this what a great hope that you and I have that is a divine protection that we have one even if you know even if, if even if we die we, we do not fear that's what Paul says and uh, he writes to the Thessalonian church we do not we do not you know fear we do not cry the reason is we have an eternal hope that we have. We will be resurrected in the Lord. That's why Paul, when he writes to uh, the Philippine church, he says, you know, I wish to be you know, in my body. Uh, you know, I, I wish to go and be with Christ. You know, he, for, for him, it is like for him, he says, death is a gain unto me. He doesn't fear even death. Now, that is the hope that we have in Christ. So this, this protection is not just our physical protection. It also, you know, our our mental and emotional protection where we are not afraid even at the face of a, a threatening pandemic you know what a great encouragement that we have in christ and then he goes on to the prophet joel shows that we are purified sanctified in our god that is what this restitution does chapter 3 and verse 17 so you shall know that i the lord your god dwell in zion my holy mountain and Jerusalem shall be holy and strangers shall never again pass through it. Let me read it verse, you know, in the NLT version also. New Living Translation. It says, then you will know that I, the Lord, your God, live in Zion. My holy mountain, Jerusalem, will be holy forever. So this restitution, this uh, restoration, what does it do? It takes us towards holiness it takes us towards uh, uh, sanctification purification that is what you know we see uh, here what a beautiful thing it says God says it's my holy mountain Jerusalem will be holy forever now that is why when uh, we study in uh, you know in Revelation what does God say there when you read the uh, Revelation he says those who are holy let them continue to be holy you know, he talks about a continuous uh, holiness. You know, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11. 22, 11 says, Let the evil doers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Why? It, when it talks about the new new Jerusalem, it talks about the new heaven, it talks about the new earth, you know, it, it, uh, it shows that God takes us through uh, holiness forever you know it, it is not uh, it is not a uh, holiness it's not an up and down holiness you know, it, it, but it is it is a continual sanctification continual purity continual holiness that is what it, it says that's when paul we talk in, in in romans writing in romans chapter 8 and verse uh, 30 uh, in fact uh, let me read verse uh, 29 and 30 uh, romans uh, chapter 8 uh, verse 29 and 30 for those or let me from verse 28 onwards we know that all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son 
in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What is, uh, what is Paul actually saying here? He's saying that God takes us from one degree of holiness to another degree. He, God takes us from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. I mean, this is actually an exciting and a very encouraging uh, truth that we actually see from the word of God. That this restoration, the final restoration, the final restitution, you know, we, we are actually marching towards that. That's why look at the 29th verse, he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son. The same words Paul uses in, in his letter, second epistle to the Corinthian church also. Where he says, when he talks about from one degree to another degree of glory, he says that we, we grow in the likeness and image of his son. Amen. That is what this uh, restoration looks like. So one, once we experience this restoration, it is not going back. Rather, it is going forward. Growing in God's holiness. You know, that is that, and yearning to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. You know, having that mind of Christ. That is what this uh, restoration, the restoration looks like. And the next thing is, we are, he, he God, he, through this restoration, through this uh, restitution, you and I are purposed. And in fact, you know, I uh, wanted to say, you know, prospered. But more than being prospered, we are actually purposed. What does it actually mean? God does prosper us. Why? With the purpose. What is that purpose? Look at the verse 18 onwards, 18 to 20 in the third chapter of Joel. In that day, the mountain shall drip sweet wine, the hills shall flow with milk, all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and water the wadi shit. You know, the first chapter talked about you know the desolation of God's people and the land of God's people. Third chapter closes with the, you know, the, the prosperity, how God's blessing comes upon his people. But for what? And as I said, this restoration is not just a restoration for us to go back to an old state, or a, uh, but rather to much, much better state. What is that? Look closely at the second, uh, late, the second part of the 18th verse. A fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the war shittim. Now, I do not have actually enough time to, you know, uh, get into all the details, but this, the shittim is a place which is a desolate, dry desert. What God is saying that in, on that day, when I restore you, when you are restored, you know, what will happen? It is not only that your life is restored, you will restore people's lives that are like that are dried like a desert you know that is why when uh, jesus when he was talking to his disciples in john chapter 7 was 37 to 39 what did, what did he say the last day of the festival the great day while jesus was standing there he cried out that anyone who is thirsty come to me let the one who believes in me drink as the scripture has as the scripture has said out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water now he said this about the spirit which believers in him were to receive for as said there was no spirit because jesus was already glorified what did what did jesus say that you who come to me and drink of me not only you not only your thirst is met not only your you are satisfied from you living waters will flow and it will satisfy others. What satisfaction this is? That through you and me, through our restoration, people will come to redemption. Amen. In fact, the, the that's how we ended the last chapter, the second chapter, that our sincere repentance leads us towards the redemption of others for them to you know, know and come to Christ. In fact, it, it is it's even more than that. Here it talks about, you know, the fountain that which actually flows, living waters that flows. 
that is you know god restores us to a very much better place what place is that you know people to whom you talk to to people to whom you share the good news the people whom with whom you whom you encourage whom you counsel you know what god is saying that living waters will flow through you and touch their lives and you know those areas in their lives that are dry like a desert i will make i'll bring i'll give my life into them they will know me they will come to me amen that is what god says in fact again coming to revelation the last chapter 22nd chapter of revelation 1 and 2 what did, uh, what does uh, god say there say that to john that the angel showed me the river of the water of life bright as crystal flowing from the throne of god and of the lamb through the middle of the street of uh, of the city on either side of the river is a tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit producing its fruit each month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations i really like this you know it's beautiful that this river flows from the throne of god and the lamb he is the source of this river and actually as god says it flows from there uh, from god it flows through you and me it flows to the nations it flows to the people amen what a great uh, blessing this restoration brings and what does it says this does not flow you know it is this is not a seasonal flow rather it is on every month so that the fruit or this 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 12 kinds of fruit are produced each month so this is a you know uh, being fruitful bringing uh, fruit all the month and not only that they become bring healing to the nations all right the chapter begins with punishment of the nations but through christ through you and me it brings healing unto the nation that is what god wants to do through our restored life what a great responsibility that we have amen and uh, let me close with the last uh, uh, area of this restoration rest- restitution is pardoned it talks about what is what is god saying i'm going to pardon here the last verse of the third chapter let me read this from the mlt version new living translation i will pardon my people's crimes which i have not yet pardoned and i the lord will make my home in jerusalem with my people he is saying you know all the sins of which i have not yet pardoned i would pardon everything this is the restoration that is the restitution i would pardon all the sins of my people which i have not yet pardoned until now and i am going to dwell with my people you know that it talks about god's dwelling with us what an amazing promise this is that judgment you know reminds us of one very important truth what is it actually you know reminds us is that the more we know that the day of the lord is near the more closer walk we need to have with god amen but the more we know that the day of the lord is near that's why the all of the three chapters we find the day of the lord is near the day of the lord is coming the day of the lord is near and through the prophet joel god was uh, prophesying this during a time of a plague and warning them of the last days you and i are living in the last days we are living in the time of a plague in a pandemic may the lord you know speak to us to not only be restored back to him but to dwell with god dwell with christ to walk with him amen may the lord do that in our lives and let i'm going to uh, close with the you know in fact I want to spend a few more minutes in a couple of quotes and also share about a, a testimony and i'm going to close for us to be encouraged bill johnson pastor bill johnson beautifully says about restoration when whenever god restores something he restores it to a place greater than it was before yeah man in fact that's what i have said shared right from the beginning whenever god restores something he restores it to a place greater than it was before that is what we have seen that through god's restoration you and i understand our position in god better that you know we are 
his people we are his belonging we understand that and not only that he not only pardons us he not only purifies us he not only protects us but god uses us to bring others to him you know he makes that living waters the fountain to flow through us to people to the nations for the healing of the nations may mm -hmm. uh, this restoration take us to a place greater place than it was before than we were before i'm also going to you know quote uh, charles colson who was charles colson or he was he was also known as chuck colson uh, who was a who was a politician uh, who, uh, who uh, served during uh, uh, president nixon's time in the usa and uh, charles colson says this let me uh, you know uh, share this with you it is not what we do that matters but what a sovereign god chooses to do through us god doesn't want our success he wants us he doesn't demand our achievements he demands our obedience the kingdom of god is a kingdom of paradox where through the ugly defeat of a cross a holy god is utterly glorified victory comes through defeat healing through brokenness finding self through losing self he talks about two things one is that the cross for the world might look like a defeat but for those who have come to the cross know it is the ultimate victory and our lives even though it might be broken when we come to christ return to christ to be restored he heals our brokenness amen that is what charles colson says and charles colson is not you know sharing this as uh, some uh, you know uh, big statement but this is his life uh, let me you know, share a few things from charles colson's life a chuck colson's life during Pres president nixon's time you may remember that there was this very quite popular scandal uh, which went uh, through during his time called the watergate scandal and uh, charles colson was convicted he was one among them he was a liaison he was convicted uh, in fact because of which president nixon had to resign and uh, i'm not going to get into all the you know the uh, of the scandal the tale to the scandal but right before his imprisonment is what charles colson you know committed his life to christ to be restored and what did what did what did this this do you know this restoration due to charles colson was he was you know as undergoing this prosecution hearings and in fact there was a time where he could have actually you know gone without imprisonment you know, the judge the judgment would have come in his favor but because charles colson committed his life to christ you know what did what he did what did he do in fact against his his lawyers and he himself was advocate against his prosecutor's wish he pleaded guilty he was one of you know a top a person in president nixon's cabinet he pleaded guilty why he said i have committed my life to be restored by christ and i have to live it and show it through my life because he pled guilty he was imprisoned he was put behind bars he was sentenced for a few years for close to 3 years but uh, he was released in uh, 7 months but after his release or through his imprisonment god did something even better not only god brought charles colson close to him restored his life to him god gave him a new ministry that's how charles colson started this ministry called prison fellowship which later became prison fellowship international which even even until today they have their ministry in more than i think 120 countries or close 150 countries where you know they take the good news to prisoners to their family members they do an amazing job of restoring the prisoners and their families to christ you know amazing that's why you know charles colson uh, he talks about this in one of his books he says but all at once i realized that it was not my success god used to enable me to help those in this prison or in hundreds of others just like it 
my life of success was not what made this morning so glorious all my achievements met, meant nothing in god's economy no the real legacy of my life was my biggest failure that i was an ex convict my greatest humiliation being sent to prison was the beginning of god's greatest use of my life he chose the one thing in which i could not glory for his glory i mean really a powerful statement that charles colson makes he says my greatest humiliation being sent to prison was the beginning of god's greatest use of my life he chose the one thing in which i could not glory for his glory i mean that is what god's restoration can do when we commit our lives to god to be restored uh, back to him he he just not only he restores something he restores our life to a place greater than it was before amen and through christ we have a great encouragement of how god's restoration looks like and let us not only you know continue to be, uh, commit ourselves to be restored unto him but even as we know that the day of the lord is near let us continue to walk with god let us continue to dwell in his presence and understanding our responsibility to bring others to christ and also to restore fellow believers back to christ let us be encouraged to do that amen shall we pray father god we thank you lord for once again speaking to us lord for encouraging us exhorting us from your word of father yes lord you are a god who restores us thank you father lord you restore us lord the wasted years not only that of father you add your divine blessings of father on our lives of father thank you lord as yes, father lord as the lord who could uh, lord the lord whom you restored uh, charles colson of father a uh, convict uh, as master to a better place to bring lord uh, hundreds thousands of prisoners to you through a new ministry that you entrusted them the same way of father even as you restore us we know that lord that you have better plans better purposes for our lives of father all that we ask this lord that lord that we will grow from one degree of holiness to another degree of holiness we will grow from one degree of glory to another degree of glory oh master thank you lord even as we know that your day is near lord help us oh father to lord walk with you every day lord that lord that every as the revelation says our father that lord that we will be like those trees of father that produce fruit every month of father which will result in the healing of people in the healing of nations of oh master thank you father for speaking unto us we commit us into your hands in jesus name lord we pray amen amen